didn't understand the Dikaiao word group in Greek and had a less than sterling view of justification that therefore Augustine didn't have the gospel? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Look, um, uh, let, let me expand that out for everybody else. Um, uh, Alistair McGrath, in his book, uh, does discuss, uh, and I've, I've not read any interactions with McGrath on this. I, I think there are some out there. Um, there's just too much literature to get to these days. But let's, take, let's go ahead and take uh, the reality that Augustine was much more familiar with the scriptures in Latin. His Greek was very minimal and not overly accurate. He had no Hebrew at all. And as a result, his understanding of the nature of dikaiao, dikaiosune, the righteousness word group, uh, especially as it appears in in Paul, uh, would not be, quote-unquote, reformed. Even though he did believe in divine election, uh, in the sovereignty of grace, um, all the rest of these things, as far as the nature of imputed righteousness, uh, he did believe that there would be, there could be non-elect Christians, that there could be people who uh, profess faith in Christ and are in some sense saved. But since they're not elect, they're not given the gift of perseverance, so they won't persevere. And so they will, they will fall away, because uh, you have to have the gift of perseverance to, to persevere. So he did believe that there is an elect people of God who are given the gift of perseverance and cannot be lost. So that's where he would differ from the sacramental system of Rome today, which always has to have that possibility of, of being lost. But anyway, um, and so... In light of that, there would be people who would say, well, then in light of what we understand today, then Augustine didn't have the gospel. Because if you're going to say, you know, what if you have someone who comes along in the church today and takes a view of justification that does not, you know, walk the line and recognize in the imputed righteousness of Christ and the, the nature of the uh, union of the elect with Christ, and so on, you're not going to view that person as, as orthodox. You're not going to recommend their teachings. I mean, look at people like Brian Zond and, and, and people like that, the, the emergent church and Greg Boyd and, and the people who've gone off, you know, the people who are attacking penal substitutionary atonement and, and things like this. Uh, and they'll just throw Augustine uh, into that into that big pile. And that preaches well. Uh, it also demonstrates that you've spent three seconds reading church history um, or three seconds thinking about what you read in church history and the reality uh, that if you... If you start judging 4th century believers, uh, 5th century believers, by the standard of what came out in the middle of the 16th century, there's not going to be many Christians left at any point in time. And that's why, once again, this takes us back here through the historical uh, method, takes us back to having to define what is definitional, what is known by an individual, what is adiaphora, and the reality that um, the standard that we use today, when we turn around and try to apply it backwards, we are automatically going to end up uh, dismissing the vast majority of those who came in the faith before us because we are going to try to drag them into a context that was not theirs on the basis of primarily ignorance of our own part. For example, if no one presented to Augustine and no one did, uh, cause he would have talked about it. If, if, if no one presented to Augustine, the actual sound understanding of the Dikaya O Dikaya Sune word group in Greek, um, how do you know how he would have responded to it had it been presented to him? You have no way of knowing. 
And so it is a form of, again, doctrinal perfectionism, which is alive and well today, um, that allows us to pretend that we can look back in history and judge the thoughts and intentions of others um, when we don't know what they knew and we don't know what they would have done had a fuller truth been given to them. And so the issues that that eventually developed that led to the Reformation were not the issues that Augustine was dealing with in his day. He was dealing with Pelagianism and he got that right. Uh, but there were inconsistencies in him. And if there's inconsistencies in one of the greatest theologians of the West ever, and in all the theologians of the East as well, um, then we should be very, slow to claim doctrinal perfectionism for ourselves, which is one of the one of the problems I really have with a lot of fundamentalism is that it assumes on the part of highly uneducated people a level of doctrinal perfectionism, uh, which they do not possess and don't and they don't care whether that's true or not, they assume it. Uh, that's one of the the ugly things about fundamentalism uh, on that level. So um, the the real problem here is that this requires a level of fairness, that I just don't see a lot of people today being willing to extend to people of the past. Um, uh, modern Christians spend very little time entering into the world of the, of the church in the past. And as a result, when they do, uh, they often do so with a baseball bat rather than with wondering admiration at people who uh, very often are willing to be martyrs when we complain about how far we have to walk uh, to the church building in our mega church parking lot. And at the same time, then turn around and say, those people weren't Christians, but we are. I, I think we have to be very, very, very careful at that point and leave the final judgment to God. And um, in this situation, if you've not read more than three paragraphs of Augustine, I would really be slow to judge him based upon what you read in the secondary source. Um, so, uh, I can't judge people's hearts now. It's a whole lot worse to try to judge people's hearts from, uh, 15, 1600 years distance. And yet that's exactly what we pretend we have the capacity and ability to do. And so, yeah, it's, it's very common. I mean, you can see the real surface level type in, uh, people like Dave Hunt and, and that ilk. Uh, that that just dismiss Augustine and and and, and throw him out. Um, I, I think that is going to lead us to a position where we're almost the only ones left standing, um, and really ends up making you question whether uh, Christ did build his church or not. And so I I do recommend the reading of church history, and I recommend the reading of church history with a firm conviction of sola scriptura and tota scriptura. That is the standard. We can, we can judge Augustine's teaching on this subject without at the same time judging his heart because we lack the ability to do so from a distance and the information upon which to do so that we might have to exercise today. In other words, in one of our fellowships today, we have a doctrinal standard. We can lay out what justification means. And so if someone is in my church, and they start teaching what Augustine taught against what is being taught in the doctrinal standards of the church, well, that's a different issue because we, we now have a standard. And they, they knew that standard when they joined. And here we can, we, we can lay it all out, uh, but we can't do that with people in the past. Um, it definitely preaches better than what I just told you. I mean, if you want, if you want to get people all upset or if you want to... Uh, get out your theological sword and run somebody from the past through, that's a whole lot easier to do than to try to maintain the balance that I was just talking about and looking at, at history. But the interesting thing is I'm old enough now to realize that if the, if the Lord keeps time running the way it's running right now, 50 years from now, someone's going to be looking back at my ministry. And I want to be judged on the basis of what I knew where I was, not something 50 or 500 or 1500 years from now. Uh, people don't think of it that way. We all, we're always just looking at ourselves. So 
that's my uh, that's my thoughts on that. Thomas? All right. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm taking in everything you said, but yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.